Saul was a man of the city, and the beat of the city is in the language of his letters. From the beginning, Paul's plan for spreading the gospel was to go to strategically located cities and start churches there. In this way, small groups of Christian believers were scattered throughout the Mediterranean area. Paul kept in touch with the churches, sometimes through visits or through reports carried to him by other Christians. But most often, his contact was through letters by which he nurtured, counseled, and sometimes corrected the congregations. His letters also served to link the scattered Christian communities together. In the ancient world, the term letters could include a variety of documents, some commercial, some legal, some political, and some correspondence of a personal kind. Paul drew upon the literary forms and conventions of his day, adapting them for his purposes and use. Professor David E. Awney tells us about the unique features of Paul's letter writing and will explain something of the Jewish and Greek influences evident in the letters. The letter was the most popular literary form in early Christianity. In fact, 21 of the 27 books of the New Testament are actually letters, up to 14 of which traditionally have been ascribed to Paul. Paul's letters are the earliest Christian documents of the New Testament, and 1 Thessalonians, written about AD 49, is probably the first one he wrote. His letters are a unique combination of Jewish and Greek styles of letter writing designed to influence and shape the lives and thoughts of early Christian communities from which he was separated. Paul's letters were written over a 10-year period, beginning with AD 49, but they really had their greatest impact after they'd been collected about AD 100 to form, along with the later collection of the Gospels, about AD 125, the two basic sections of the canonical New Testament, the Gospel and the Apostle. Paul's distinctive letter-writing style found early imitators. 2 Thessalonians 2.2 warns against forged letters claiming to be from Paul and his co-workers. Further, there's general scholarly consensus that Ephesians and the pastorals, uh, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, weren't actually written by Paul, but rather were produced after his death by his spiritual disciples. As an important step in understanding Paul's letters, it's helpful to focus on some of the influences that shaped the development of his unique and influential style. There are at least three such influences. First, there's the Hellenistic Greek letter writing tradition. Second, the Jewish letter writing tradition, which had largely assimilated Hellenistic patterns. And finally, third, the Greco-Roman rhetorical tradition the ways in which people were taught to speak and write persuasively. The style of Hellenistic letters remained relatively stable from the 3rd century BC through the 3rd century AD. There were three distinct styles of Hellenistic letters. The common letter, the kind people read and just throw away. The literary letter, the kind educated people wrote for publication. And finally, the official letter, the kind written by kings, emperors, and even magistrates to particular cities to regulate aspects of public life. The common or private letter is well known to us through thousands of papyrus letters preserved in the dry sands of Egypt. While the central section of these letters, that is the part containing the message, is usually quite short, unlike most of Paul's letters. The introductory and concluding parts use many fixed formulas that have numerous similarities to Paul's letters. The first section of typical letters included three essential elements, the sender, the receiver, and then finally the salutation or reading. Some letters followed the first section with a prayer. All of these features occur in a papyrus letter written in Egypt about 168 BC. Isseus to her brother Hephaestion, greeting. If you are well and other things are going right, it would accord with a prayer which I make continually to the gods. All of these elements, in slightly different form actually, occur in most of the Pauline letters. 
1 Thessalonians 1, 1 and 2 is a good example. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers. Both letters mention the sender, the receiver, and the salutation, and both include a prayer as well. First Thessalonians is distinctive, however, in that it is sent by a group, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, even though it's really apparent that Paul's the primary author, to a group, the church at Thessalonica. The salutation, grace to you and peace, is also distinctive. Paul here uses a play on words. The typical Greek salutation was chirene, or greetings, used both in letters and when greeting people in public. Paul substitutes the word charis, grace, which has a similar sound. He also includes the term peace, a common translation of the Hebrew word shalom used as a salutation in Jewish letters. Since Paul indicates that grace and peace have a divine source, both function as abbreviations for the Christian gospel. They are really verbal symbols of the Christian faith, just as the cross is a visual symbol of that faith. Both refer to aspects of Christian salvation. Grace refers to the undeserved benefits that Christians have received from God, while peace emphasizes the restored relationship between God and God's people through Christ. Paul's letters also reflect the influence of Hellenistic official letters sent by political authorities to cities under their control for the purpose of regulating aspects of public life. These letters are preserved almost exclusively in inscriptions on stone, a common way of publishing ancient legal documents. These inscribed official letters could be found by the hundreds in the public areas of ancient cities. The short opening section of a letter from Ptolemy II of Egypt from 262 BC is a typical example. Ptolemy the king to the council and people of Miletus, greeting. Now, unlike authors of private letters, public officials formally identified themselves using official titles, just as Paul formally identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ in most of his letters. Again, official letters were almost exclusively directed to political groups, just as Paul directed his letters almost exclusively to church groups. Finally, official letters were a means of intervening in local affairs, often at the requests of local petitioners, just as Paul's letters were designed to change the beliefs and behaviors of those to whom he wrote. The central sections of Paul's letters make much more sense to us in light of the influence of Greco-Roman rhetoric, the use of effective persuasive language. There are three main types of ancient rhetoric. First, judicial rhetoric, language typically used in court to convince judges and juries about past events. Second, deliberative rhetoric, language generally used in politics to persuade assemblies to take a particular course of action in the future. Finally, third, demonstrative rhetoric is language used to change people's opinions and values in the present. Though we know little about Paul's formal education, his letters do indicate that he was a really persuasive speaker who used aspects of all three of these types of rhetoric in his letters. Each type of rhetoric tended to structure speeches into four simple parts. First, the introduction, in which the main issue is highlighted. Second, the narrative or statement of facts. Third, the argument, often the longest part of the speech. And four, the conclusion or summary. The argument in Galatians, for example, is primarily deliberative, aimed at persuading the readers to a future course of action. After Paul had left Galatia, Jewish Christians persuaded the Galatians that obedience to the Jewish law was necessary for salvation and that it was really Paul himself who was off base. In the introduction in Galatians 1, 6 to 10, 
Paul actually shocks the Galatians by telling them that any gospel other than the one they originally believed is bogus. In the narrative of Galatians 1, 11 to 2, 21, he tells about his own apostolic commission and proclamation of faith in Christ as the only way of salvation. The longest section of the letter, Galatians 3, 3 through 5, 12, contains a whole arsenal of arguments emphasizing the freedom that believers have through faith in Christ apart from the works of the law. Finally, after switching to a section of typically demonstrative rhetoric in Galatians 5.13 to 6.10, he summarizes the argument of the entire letter in Galatians 6.11 through 15 by emphasizing that it's not the works of the law, such as circumcision, but really new life in Christ Jesus that really counts. Then Paul goes back to his typical way of ending a letter. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen.